Well, folks, we're in it. We are in it for the long haul tonight. As fortunately, I have two good friends to join me for the duration of the rest of the night, as we are not done quite yet. Smacks, Nova. If game one was one sided for no team, that game was even more one sided for Ginger Turmeric, as I, I think that the Scion Flex in, in draft uh, threw a big wrench in the plan. I know that we opened up the desk, you know. Teasing uh, Senna combos for Ginger Turmeric. They pulled out a new one, and it worked out in their favor, Nova. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's exactly what I said before the game started. Like, you can't count out Ginger Turmeric because the org is new, but the players are not, right? You give City a jungle counterpick, and you give him priority in the mid lane, and he will make sure that things change, right? So um, I think the one thing that no team kind of forced was like, oh, this Olaf Soraka worked first game one. Like, it'll probably work game two. And then you look at how it played out in draft, and like, obviously, GCC just had the upper hand in this game. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think City is definitely one of those players where, like, he kind of got that first advantage, and then obviously playing get Kindred into Olaf, where, like, generally the Kindred can kind of take that advantage, and then he just, like, made sure that he took full advantage of any kind of lead that he was given. So, um, really props to Ginger Turmeric, because, I, I mean, initially I did say a 2-0 from no team, but they proved why why they're this far in, in, in PG. Yeah, the, the Scion flex was even bigger than just the bottom lane as well, because when Dragoon saw that he locked in a Mordekaiser pick, that was very easily countered by Existence's Gangplank, and Existence, in my opinion, had his best game of the whole tournament in this one. As we can see, he's topping the damage charts on this champion, and it was really a standout performance from the get-go on this one. Not to mention the Brand and Kindred really come on, coming on online early for this team, and, I mean, the graph just shows it right at the bottom left right there. We had a 17-minute team fight in no team's base to show for it as well. Like, Ginger Turmeric definitely uh, ran them over in game two. Very impressive. Yeah, a 20,000 gold lead in a 21-minute game. That's pretty good uh, for Ginger Turmeric. <laughs> uh, as uh, we do have a clip or two uh, to kind of walk through the action. I want to fly the first one, Smacks. This is the bot lane Fiesta, and we see the power already of Ginger Turmeric's Goldie, but also they play this one out really nicely uh, as... Oh, this is actually... No, top side, 3v3. Yes. We got this top side one first here, Cubby, because we got first blood over here. On to Griffin. I really like the moves here for Ginger Turmeric because they already knew where Griffin was at this point. He had just shown top lane in an attempt to gank up there. It didn't quite mm -hmm. work with City when he was there to punish. And with the whole team collapsing in on the jungle, it left Griffin in an uncomfortable position where he's not walking forward. He's not aggressing on top of you onto Olaf. He's kind of cowering away. And that's just not Olaf's MO. I know that, Nova, you were also calling Dragoon going for that flash play. Ended up being caught in a really weird position. Uh, that trade of flash flash didn't end up paying off. And uh, credit to DNA as well for getting there first. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think when you look at how that play turns out, like, uh, maybe initially it looked well. You know, we had the Olaf Soraka in the early parts of the game. Uh, you know, maybe we can just go ahead and take this fight. And then you kind of look at where Mordekaiser's position is. Like, he can't enter this fight unless he flashes, right? And then if he flashes... Then he's just in a terrible position. He's separated from his team, and it's just like it's pretty downhill from there. Um, so I kind of saw what they're going for, but definitely the execution just didn't work out. Yeah, and downhill from there was the story. Is we're gonna head downhill to this bot lane play. This is where the gold lead came in. This is where there was some beautiful juggling of aggro from Ginger Turmeric, and you really get to see the strength of this Scion Senna Nova. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in game one, we kind of saw them play away from Five Fire. You know, he's playing that Ziggs where he's going to be more of a neutralizer. And this is the one part where, like, no team is like, okay, we can maybe make something happen towards the bot side. Um, I mean, obviously, GTC maybe kind of saw the King of Amateur in the ball lane, and they're like, we need to do something more <laughs> to shut him down, right? Um, and that's kind of what ended up happening in this particular play. The one thing to really keep in mind is watch this Five Fire ult. He comes in. If he if Duo King does not block this for DNA, it is very, I mean, it is 100% likely that he's just going to die to that Jinx ultimate. So I'm, yeah. I don't know if that was on purpose but my god that was played really well <laughs> and then obviously you just have the Senna heals it just comes in the sun is perfect on the Soraka I mean that was just a great play from GTC and from there we don't have any other replays uh this game was a smash <laughs> it was all ginger turmeric now back to the drawing board no team this time they're the ones that have to bounce back young team Nova what are you looking for in this game three I, I think that was a big difference uh the look from five fire I'm also expecting no team to go back to red side what are you thinking 
Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, did get word that they're going to be swapping sides, which I think is really exciting because it's one thing that we were talking about off the desk. Like, I think red side is very utilized well. I mean, I, I'm in all the didn't games that I've watched and casted, whenever teams usually have the side selection, they go for that red side. And it's because you get that counter pick in, on the five pick, which is really important. And then you also get the pick on three where you can generally just ban two afterwards that are like counters, right? It's just very, it's very nice how that can usually be set up. Um, and I think it really comes in handy too when you look at DNA's champion pool. He plays these Anevias, he plays these brands, right? Um, you can kind of nullify maybe a mid lane counter pick um, or maybe even an existence top lane counter pick like we saw with the GP. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in order for either team to win, it's really just going to boil down to who's able to be prepared for draft the best. Um, I think both teams are kind of struggling with this blue side draft. So now that Ginger Turmeric is going back to the blue side, I really hope that they're able to maybe pull something out that we didn't see from game one. Smacks, any other final thoughts? Anything you're looking out for? Do we see Olaf Soraka again? Is the Senna going to be left through? Uh, again, for Ginger Turmeric, I, I want to see them go for this Gwen. I think that if they stop banning it on blue side, they can first pick that one, and it was, they can go from there. Okay, interesting call out. Uh, only a couple seconds left till we hop into game three. Before we send it back to Rebel and Travesty, do want to just give one last shout out to the hashtag we are unified. Uh, as I've been unified in, in pushing this for all six games. So I, uh, hopefully, <laughs> if you haven't gotten your words on broadcast yet, uh, this is your last chance. Uh, so tweet at us with the hashtag we are unified, and your tweet could show up on twitch.tv slash academy. Now, that's enough from us and the desk. Smacks, Nova, thanks for all your wonderful thoughts going into this last game. We'll see what ends up happening between No Team and Ginger Turmeric as our final game of the day. Going to be off to the races. Travesty, Rebel Fox, one more time. Take it away. The races, indeed, as uh, there is one heck of a race that has happened. Uh, we are going into game number three, but another development has happened off stream two. Rebel, you were looking at the points here. This match just became a lot more important for Ginger. <laughs> yes, so Ginger Turbo currently sit 11th place. In order to actually qualify, they would have to win this match, right? And Wildcard Aces, having just lost in the other bracket, it is either they or their sister team, Wildcard, the main roster, tied at 65 points. That would get booted out if, if for some reason, Ginger Turmeric were able to take this game right now and take the series because they'd get jumped up in points. So one of the two Wildcard teams would get booted from that top 10, not be able to go to Proving Grounds if Ginger Turmeric win this. And if not... We have our top 10 set. Ginger Turmeric don't get to qualify. So this is literally a life or death match for Ginger Turmeric to continue their lives, not just in this tournament, but in proving grounds as well. They'd have to go through a qualifier. But man, I, I can't imagine how hungry they have to be for a win against no team right now. No pressure. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Both games, though, have been just dominant affairs from the winning opposition right we saw no team in game number one a dominant performance moving zigs around the map having fantastic macro and then in the other game it we saw no team kind of limit test a little bit and then also we saw ginger have such a better understanding of the matchup and what strengths that no team are looking to exude and really getting themselves into more comfortable picks and getting a dominant win that way we're going into game number three. Another big setup is going to be something key to keep our eyes on. Yeah, to, to me, it's an early game play, right? You have to be understanding of what your early game is going to entail to make sure you can take an advantage. Game one, that was the case for no team. Game two, that was clearly the case for Ginger Turmeric. So whoever's been able to take out that early lead has really not been able to drop it at all. Both teams have been not able to, not really capable of denying anything. I have to expect no team back on the red side. They have the possibility of going back to Olaf Soraka, but I think if they really, really want to play out this series effectively against this GTC team, uh, they might have to go away from it. They have, might have to try yeah. something more standard to make sure that Blaze has a bit more agency because DNA, it, that last game was just completely shutting out anything that Soraka and uh, you know, the Olaf were able to accomplish at all. GTC now understand the ban. They got to throw the Ziggs ban in to put Firefire into a slightly worse position as well. It is, you know, Ginger Turmeric came out with adaptions in game number two, and now it's no team's job to figure out what they can do to actually change things up. I think it's interesting too. Our desk already hit on it. No team has kind of had to be stuck in the same bands. Tristana, Callista, Syndra. Is Syndra is still banned here with the standard bands that they have been doing throughout. The answer is like, do, do they just grab the Senna early again? 
I think they, I would like to see them do that. I don't think they take it at the first possible pick, which does open it up to whether Five Fire can play it. But again, that's not necessarily a champion he's got. I love the Gwen pickup. I know Smacks talked about that on the second desk. It got banned out in game number two. Uh, but this comes back to GTC because they were on blue side. They ban off the Darius. They say there's no counter pick here for Yu Dragoon. And now Existence gets something powerful and something that works as a weak side take in the very early stages. And no team with no Ziggs on the board looking at the jinx which to me it wasn't horrible for five fire five fire played it pretty well but it wasn't able to pop off i think the way that he really intended it to in the in kind of the laning phase and being able to push for anything more and right there the graves gets taken as well whether or not that's actually a top playing graves for dragoon almost certainly the case but again flexibility still there if Griffin wants to take it although i have to suspect again with the gwen having already been taken that it's almost certainly going up into the top side yeah it's it's something that we're more so assuming in regards to it uh they are seeing a couple hovers over onto the other side of the table, but I think you you said it perfectly. Why not just take this combo again if you want to take the Senna? The Scion is the lock, and again, they want Lagrange on this pick. <sighs> See, now the question to me is, do you have something in your back pocket for Chishuka that can punish against a lane that, to me at least, probably shouldn't have the most ridiculous amount of kill pressure? Like, yeah, like yes, Scion can engage really hard. Yes, uh, you've got some solid poking damage from the Senna and such. But I feel like this is in a lane that the Jinx should feel particularly uh, you know, threatened in, um, mm -hmm. outside of some really weird, tricky plays. As long as you've got your summoners, you're really never under threat of being full engaged upon. They go with the Ari to start with. I want them to take a little bit of time to consider the possibility of what picks could go into the bottom side. I, it, like, Yumi is a possibility to me. Sona is a possibility to me. That's more of a duo king champion. But if Jujuk has got something like that, you have to consider all of these options uh, to try to punish this bottom lane, because it's a non-standard bottom lane, and you're not going to beat it if you're playing in a very standard way. That's what happened in the last game, at least. You can't necessarily trust that you're going to be able to pull out a win against these two, especially with how powerful Duo King looked on this champion. Yeah, Duo King has always looked impressive on Senna. I don't think we've seen a Senna game out uh, inside of this qualifier that we've been like, wow, that was just a terrible performance. Duo King always shows up on this champion. And in game number three, with everything on the line, they say, all right, you know what? We're going to go for this comfort. We're going to make sure that Duo King is going to be the player that's going to be able to emphasize on the Senna. And we saw the damage that got to come out inside that last game. We got to see the Senna pop off inside that last game. We see the bands coming in. I am curious to see exactly. We're seeing Gangplank being banned away. We're seeing them still not entirely convinced that this Graves is in the top side. I think they should convince themselves of more of it and try to take off at least one other like jungle champion from the pool just to make sure Griffin is in complete comfort. Hecarim still isn't gone. They could go back to Hecarim if they really, really wanted to, which is a pretty powerful pick to like slip this late into the draft. They're that convinced that it's not going to be the Graves in the top side. Really? Huh. Griffin has played a lot of Graves, so yeah. I, 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 I can see that part, but... Uh... The Cho'Gaff would be very curious to see indeed. We haven't seen the Cho'Gaff in competitive in quite a bit. That's the hover. See what gets locked in. I can appreciate it as uh, for the potential that it actually brings. This would be something okay. I think much more comfortable for Yashuka. Yes. If it weren't a center pick, I would have advocated for Bard, but unfortunately, I don't. That, that, that matchup isn't particularly fun unless you're just mm. perma out of lane, which you don't necessarily want. So instead, you go for something that uh, I think. It's both defensive against the Scion full engage, but also can poke down pretty easily in the beginning of the game. It has something that helps out the Jinx in a number of different ways and is pretty good at skirmishing. I think Jishuk is really good at it. So um, it's the much more stock standard type enchanter pick that you would go for. And DNA is not going to go for anything crazy. Just opt for the victor pick into the Ari. Could open up for Ari to have some solid play in the beginning of the game. Hopefully get out and help out in the mid jungle combination where the Blaze and Griffin were in the beginning of the stages of the game. We're just waiting now for what uh, what jungle pick is opted for. Unless they decide to go for City Witty uh, Gwen, which is another possibility. They got to get that info up now, though. That's the the deficit to being on blue side. If you don't get to hold that information to the very end. And the heck we're making it all the way till the very end. He's going to City Witty, who had a very very strong hacker and performance recently. I keep that in the back of your mind as no team's going to have to show exactly what they're looking to play out. Is it going to be the Graves in the top side against the Gwen, something that Dragoon, I'm certain, has played before, and you're going to counterpick jungle, or is it going to be the Graves jungle, and now you have to, uh, you have to come up with a counterpick for the top side? It looks as though it really is, it is not going to be Graves top. It's going to be the set top lane into the Gwen, 
as the response. I, I gotta give props to the side of Ginger Turmeric and especially Argentum, because there's almost no way that you would definitely know that that was going to be the case. But they were so convinced that this Graves was going into the jungle for this game that they double banned despite having the Gwen in, uh, in like the V1 and seeing the response pick of the Graves immediately after. They stuck to their guns and forced it down Dragoon further on the mm -hmm. pool than you would have wanted it to. You would have wanted him on the gangplank of the Jax before you wanted him on the set, but here we are. Where this is the last remaining thing that he wanted to take into this individual matchup. You could appreciate that kind of uh, you know, preparation that you have for a game like this. It would have been very easy to get baited by the fact that there's been so many games that Dragoon has played on this top lane Graves that it would have been very simple to just assume that's going top and get uh, you know, potentially run through with something that you weren't expecting. They did their research. They did their prep. They checked all the boxes and it came up for them to be able to grab a matchup for themselves that they could possibly enjoy. However, I do want to highlight Dragoon's set here too this is a champion that dragoon is time and time again impressed upon everybody with so keeping special attention over there towards the top side to see exactly how it goes it's been a little bit of an island that has been affected by the jungle matchup after the chaos in the mid lane kind of subsides so keep an eye out on that especially since gwen like you were talking about earlier our desk was wanting to see it smats especially wanting to see it Existence has shown presence when they're on these carries. This is a game that actually ends up being a lot more quiet than our first couple. Um, we don't have a Soraka like Olaf. We don't have any sort of uh, like aggressive picks like even the Kindred to pop out here. The Hecarim will get active pretty early. And again, Blaze, if he's got the D-Bats and such, he could probably get better wave clear than the Victor before the E augmented upgrade and maybe make an impact across the splash and try to do something like that. But ultimately, really, the only person I expect to get very ag aggressive in the earlier stages is City Witty on the Hecarim, which is something that he did during their qualifier match to actually get them to this position against EGP. So, um, and again, it seems like the side of Ginger Turmeric, they've been playing for team fighting the majority of these games. And while game two was this massive spike of gold, uh, you know, to get into their pocket, this is kind of the style that they've been wanting to go for. And finally, no team, they yield to it. They say, okay, we'll, we'll take something of, of similar kin, right? I don't think it's a perfect amalgamation of a team fighting composition altogether, but they definitely have more pieces that scale a little bit later into the game. They're not going to try to enforce their willpower within the first 10 minutes of the game the way they had in games one and two. Yeah, the mid-game spike is going to be uh, a curious little detail. I, I, I feel like you normally see Hecker once they get their first item. That's usually a decisive point. Victor wants to get to that two-item part. Uh, Senna, of course, wants to get some itemization in the pocket. Scion just is... He, he's, a, he's getting HP. He's a sponge. Uh, Gwen is going to want to get more itemization to be able to chop the side down. I, I mean, I feel like this is a composition that on paper, this looks like a very comfortable composition from Ginger, but an over on the other side, no team is one of these teams that will surprise you in an instant. But they will. As we load up for game number three, our sixth game of the night, Travis. And yep. A qualifier match. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Ginger Turmeric, the <laughs> potential kicking out a wild card. Like... <laughs> Why did remember they have the to give tense? us two? You yeah, remember, remember the tense air? Remember how emotionally <laughs> drained we were after the first best of three, and this is our <laughs> second best of three to decide our final team in the top ten to go to proving grounds. Oh. Tension in the air. We're not even all playing any of the champions here. We're tense <laughs> over here. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine what the players go through in a situation like this, but I know that on our desk, we've talked about it. Nova's talked about it a couple of times about how Ginger Turmeric is not just like a, a brand new team. Neither of these teams is signed as an organization, but we've seen so many of these players in a number of positions like this before. We've seen City Witty and DNA, and we've seen Dragoon, and we've seen, you know, Blaze, Five Fire. They've been here, and they've done it before. Existence was, was a professional player uh, over in uh, the TCL for a while, and so, like, they understand what positions like this are in. And so, these aren't very young teams, and it's a question now of, you know, the players that are younger, the players that don't have that kind of experience, like Griffin, um, they're getting put through a bit of a test, more of a test than other players are when they've got experience in very high pressure, high tension situations like this. Indeed they do. Griffin got that ghost, is going to be looking to run at them for sure, as this is going to be a very intense game number three. Keep our eyes on this early game, especially these junglers. 
because it seems like when they're gravitating around the mid lane, there's nothing but chaos to ensue after. And again, our, our expectation for action goes down immensely. We've had two games mm -hmm. well under 30 minutes, well under, well under 50 minutes, or uh, probably about 50 minutes of combined game time, right? And yeah. so we, our, our minds are not adjusted to the, t the pacing nope. <laughs> of what a normal game is supposed to be. And our first series was so exciting, we weren't really tracking the numbers on how long the games were, but I know that they were longer. And so this is a game that might play out in a lot more standard a way than what we've been expecting games to play out to, especially in a series like this. So um, if we're, again, my, my, my eyes go immediately to City Witty being somebody that's going to be able to make things happen on Ginger Turmeric in the beginning of the game. And Griffin is given this uh, this Graves pick specifically to be more of a carry. It's something that Griffin is, is definitely capable of doing. There's nothing wrong with what Griffin is doing, but it is lower pace than what we see the Hecarim do. It's less impact for the lanes than what we see the Hecarim capable of doing. Um, although I, I will say there's actually a decent you know, gank setup. Like Dragoon's got some CC to work with. Blaze has got mm -hmm. CC to work with to set up for Griffin. Uh, and if he's able to get into lanes, we've seen him do things on champions without their own gank setup like the Gwen before and be able to carry very, very effectively when he's got those options in the back pocket. So something to watch for in, in, in this game is, again, it's a very high farm champion, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to go interacting with his lanes if they've got gank setup for him. Because again, on that Gwen pick a couple weeks ago, was able to make very very lot of noise it's something that we yeah we, we've seen it right the gank setup is there griffin will not shy away from it it's a very young player that wants mm -hmm. to get in there get that action going get the adrenaline flowing nothing feels quite as good as being able to utilize that shotgun that you have in your hands with the graves and you can even see here griffin wow. looking to apply pressure with blaze in the top side just immediately existence understanding the, uh, the the threat that he is under and walking all the way back to the previous tower just to make sure that the defense is there as blaze stepped out it had to be good communication from bna props to him for being able to communicate that blaze was out of lane walking elsewhere getting some immediate roams on this ari i do want to know also there's been a couple of times during this evening this is the another time where five fire actually showing some solid proficiency on the jinx getting a cheater recall for a call uh, playing into this bottom lane again the, the kill threat isn't necessarily there unless you get like a full engage from the scion which doesn't seem always that feasible and especially if the the jungler is there that's where really things start to ramp up for ginger turmeric on the bottom side in terms of interaction with these two but outside of that it's a pretty safe landing phase to just be able to farm up and so five fire able to snag that one up for themselves to help them out in some of the mid game where you're going to get a little boost of gold from that item you can even see they're trying to keep the pressure on inside of the matchup duo king doing a great job trading as always but this lulu and jeans making sure to see how much this sponge can truly absorb mm -hmm. down here in the bot side putting this eye on to his limits as they get a nice shove out dragoon looking to punch existence square in the face yeah Unfortunately, the uh, the Gwen is in a situation where the W, it, being immune at a decent range circle, doesn't help against a pure melee champion like nope. this set. Uh, at best, you might be able to catch the very edge of a Haymaker, but that's about all you're going to get. And immediately, Dragoon understands uh, the, what needs to happen in a lane like this. It's very similar to other healing lanes where you go immediately uh, for some healing reduction. Now, he, he went for Executioners instead of going for Bramble. I don't think Bramble's necessarily bad because Gwen does auto-attack quite often, but her damage is high enough magic, and uh, Dragoon is aggressive enough that I think he's going to make use of the AD on this item a lot more than he would the armor on something like a Bramble Vest. So instead, going for the Executioners is the correct call, and it means that he's going to be able to have a lot of fun fighting in melee range, punishing against the Gwen that against rain champions makes their lives so much harder than it needs to be. Like you were talking about earlier, much different pacing coming out Ooh. inside of this game. You, you seen what I'm seeing for Griffin? See what oh. that item is? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> it's a gore drinker graze. It is. This is... You don't get to see it super often, especially not now, because it doesn't, like, the top lane Graves was just so into Hullbreaker and so into this. This is some tech that came up relatively recently for, for being able to kind of counteract a lot of champions that get on top of them uh, against things like Gwen and Hecarim, both of which are able mm -hmm. to get on top of Graves relatively easily. It's got so much sustain behind it to press a Gore Drinker as, <laughs> as a Graves. It feels almost wrong in some circumstances, but it is something that popped up as, as tech, and Griffin clearly adapted to it. 
Um, this is the first instance I've actually seen of it inside of a competitive game. So it's kind of cool to be able to, to do this for the first time. And it is the Zoomer who's uh, absorbing the tech more than anybody else, which is uh, you, you, knew, you knew fancy old Zoomers and your, your fancy gourd rinker. I remember when it was just yeah. Infinity Edge Rush on every market. Shaking table. your fist while you're saying this? Is yeah, that yeah, what yeah. I'm hearing right I guess so, yeah. You want to tell them to get off your lawn next? Maybe. <laughs> Doing a good job getting some farm uh, piled in. Looking for something possibly down here towards this bottom side. Looking at the dragon itself as they will jump onto it. Griffin knows, hey, there's no threat of me getting dropped at this particular moment. Ari has the push. So this is first straight going over to no team. It is. Again, the, the, the pace in this game, ridiculously slow. This happened in game one, too, but the difference is there's no Olaf Soraka, as we've attested to a couple of times now, which means that it's not likely that Griffin is all of a sudden just going to get incredibly aggressive and starts to uh, you know, attack all the lanes on the map. Instead, oh. this dragon is just ramifications for later stages of the game. I like how they spotted the graves, by the way. There was immediate pings, and I <laughs> looked over as I saw the pings, and I was like, ah, oh, City Witty is six. City Witty is ready to use the Onslaught of Shadows. Ooh. Oh, there's a solo kill happening in the mid lane. Never mind. It's going to be a rush to get out of there. Blaze find himself on the bad end of that trade. Ooh. Yeah, DNA actually doing a great job in, in just putting pressure onto the Ari. Um, at the beginning of the game, you saw a roam from Blaze that did quite a bit. And again, you kind of want to see that as Ari because the longer you stay in this lane, there's not a ton of kill threat that you have onto a victor without some additional assistance from, from Griffin. Um, and you want to get out and about. And so this gets harder as the game goes on because DNA eventually gets like the Aftershock upgrade for the E, which makes it so much easier to clear waves. So even through, uh, you know, your dematerializers, your enhanced wave clear from that ability, uh, Blaze isn't able to move nearly as quickly uh, as what, uh, you know, eventually the victor is going to be able to. And again, those upgrades start to come through. Griffin has the support of Dragoon, also has the motion of Kashuka. A little shocking that City Witty and DNA are able to read that effectively. It must be a call from their bottom lane knowing that, uh, you know, Jishuka's off the map. And so it's just a Rift Hill going into the pocket of Griffin, who muscles that out from under the side of Ginger Tumorit. Looking for some aggressiveness. Facebreaker not landing on existence. Mm -hmm. Finds the space that is needed. Griffin has been looking for a couple angles here and there, but hasn't found the exact moment as we were talking about that gank assist is there inside of the lanes but I, this ginger plays so smart there's so much good communication that must be going on there because they absolutely are keeping tabs on griffin and where they may be at and in a game like this uh, again if you're if you're looking at what's going to happen in the scaling game obviously the rift Herald getting taken is a huge one city witty trying to make an aggressive move the traps perfectly placed by Firefire though to prevent City Witty or any follow-up after City Witty comes through. Um, I'm paying attention to what's happening in the mid lane because again, DNA's got this late game monster in the victory to be able to work with and is up currently I you know 92 farm. He's got the sword shoes completed, gonna have the first uh, you know uh, upgrades completed as well when it comes to the evolutions. Uh, and again, that's gonna make Blaze's job so much harder when it comes to trying to make an effect across this map. It's gonna take some of the wind out of the sails of no team that they might have had before. The early thousand gold lead. Mostly off the back of just pushing power. Duo Kings also got those souls that don't get tracked mm -hmm. as well inside of the gold lead. So there's a lot here for Ginger Turmeric that are going well. I want to see no team make some kind of a strike. I know Griffin can't really be the one to do so. So uh, the, the members you're looking for are Blaze and Dragoon, personally. Dragoon could be a huge member to kind of build a team fight on because the set is just so powerful in the earlier stages of the game to be able to work around. Oh, check this out. Blaze caught out in a weird position wow. here. Needs to go ahead and dash out of the gravity field of dna is going to find city witty not going to be able to connect with a charm though just yet and the onslaught of shadows used defensively fantastic for them that's a huge ability taken away with dragon spawning in about a minute and a half and it's uh griffin on the bottom side just kind of doing some counter jungling actually gonna to try to wrap around maybe on duo king in the green they're gonna see him yeah, Comes TP in, is coming through as well, though. This is existence coming down to the bot lane. This completely null and voids everything that Griffin was looking to set up there. So I think it was an attempted Rift Herald drop. Griffin really just wanted to do that and then just, like, 
get it to charge in, get some gold into the Jinx and into his own pockets. And that was going to be something they could shake for. Um, and the trade-off, of course, is that now, uh, obviously, City Witty has to catch the top wave, but that's 100% an amazing play. They deny the Rift Herald draw, although Griffin's right back to bottom lane. There's no TP to cover this time, and DNA oh, doesn't have it. He's taking City well. Witty oh, for a no. ride! First Blood Dragoon! <laughs> Just underneath the tower, man. Like, what are you supposed to do about that one? The Dragoon just bullying the horse. Now, Existence is at least going to try to punish him. But again, bottom side is getting set up by Griffin to drop a Rift Herald. Oh, well. they're they're to kill. they get Scion, and Firefire is inside, the heal has been used to double kill to Griffin. Okay. One gun back by Grain, but that's about all you can say in this situation is that entire advantage that was held by Ginger Turmeric has now been completely voided. Now, the biggest thing about this, though, the Rift Herald, which is supposed to be dropped by Griffin on the bottom side of the map, that could have actually led to even more snowballing, no longer there. It's a couple of plates into the pocket of Five Fire, but that could have probably been bottom tower broken if they keep Griffin alive. Can't quite do it. Not able to happen. So, it is the fully completed Gore Drinker on the Graves who picks up two kills. He's well farmed at this point in the game, but you don't get the Rift Herald drop that you're looking for. And now, time is pressing. You need to drop it in the next little bit of time. And I'm thinking they're going to use it more so for Dragon setup. They have about a minute until plates go down as well. So hopefully Griffin can put it in a position where they can capitalize on it, but it's seeming less and less likely that they're going to be able to get a full charge and full effectiveness out of the Rift Herald because everything they've wanted to do has been around this bottom side and it's been stalled by the bottom lane of Ginger Tumor. Yeah, Griffin's over here. Gonna drop Harold right in front of their face and say, hey, yo, look, there's this thing going uh, towards the bot lane. Come deal with it. It's nice gravity field being placed onto Griffin. The CC is completely unbearable. Oh, the Gorger does so much work. <laughs> He's able to stay alive for so long. Firefire is just hitting away on all these members. DNA is on the retreat path, trying to find safety. Gets the laser out, but it's not enough. No team pop off big. Oh my goodness, the Rift Herald drop ends up not even mattering because Driffin pops it down in the river. It ends up getting into bottom side. It's actually going to push a little further because the minions are coming, but it's the team fight that they play for. The defense had already been there from existence. He's stuck in top side. There's a TP that could come in from the other side and just watch the members. First off, five fire, free firing into Lagrain and into City Witty. No one is challenging his positioning. Griffin living forever with the core trigger in this. That team is hilarious to watch. But again, it's five fire. This, this mid laner swapped to ADC, free firing with the Jinx pick that really does all the damage in the team fight. Now, this accomplishes so much more because Rick Carroll was still alive and pushed to the bottom side. That nets them first tower. They're going to grab their second or the, the first dragon of the game as well, so they get to control that. And no team get this sizable advantage. The Ari's feeling great with the Ludens. You've got Griffin in a position where you can't dive him with the Gore Drinker, and no team take this really good advantage that now they're going to be able to use to start pushing the pacing of the game. This is a scary moment to be in if you're Ginger, right? Because this has been where we have seen the leads go into oh play. Goodness. Dragoon, where's your HP go, boy? He is finding himself chased underneath the tower. Will be able to escape. Wow, Gwen does way too much damage. <laughs> I think right there also Dragoon led on a little more than you would have thought because the Haymaker was available and I think he didn't pop it because he was saving it for a really big turn potentially into existence and so because of that he didn't use it to deny damage and so you probably lose about 200-300 damage off the back of that depending on how big the shield was the Dragoon would have dropped right there um, but it would have led to existence getting more auto attacks more Qs and such off and without a, you know the, the flash it was really just a mind game played by Dragoon I think is what happened in that situation that went his way because existence was waiting for the Haymaker um, but it never came because Dragoon just knew that he could walk out if Existence had to respect it. So played by him right there, being able to get a little bit back and forth as these two continue to play back and forth. But it's mostly Griffin that's actually making a massive impact. You can see him on second Rift Herald now also taking that one off the map and making sure that it's in the pockets of no team rather than giving anything over the side of Danger Tomb Raider. Trying to drain him out and early game leads have been the theme of victory here inside of this series which is a worrying trend seeing how ginger recovers from just that you see the hecker and building that uh triforce as well first tower secured but city witty trying to get a little bit of aggression onto blaze you see the onslaught of shadows cowards being screamed out Ow. the chase down is unbearable for blaze but the immediate response top side they had one tower make that two yeah, make the cross map play actually very effective. Existence is also oh, going to get run down yeah. immediately. He's taken for the wild ride. The Haymaker does Ooh. immense damage. And that is Griffin securing the kill. Santa tried to give a little bit of shielding, but it just wasn't there in time. 
Yeah, now a 4,000 gold advantage sitting for no team, and that's going to get compounded even higher because Five Fire is going to be able to free fire on the mid tower as it's it's too much invested into the bottom side play to punish Blaze, who did give a shutdown over, uh, but that doesn't really matter when you give up that much to the other side of the map, and especially into Five Fire, who just pulled an entire mid tower. You can see he's really starting to ramp up on the Jinx pick. The top lane pick as well has uh, kind of been defended quite a bit. Dragoon is able to deny quite a bit. He's going to focus more on team fighting build at this point as well. And they're feeling great about the position that they've found themselves in. Four and a half thousand gold, even after all things uh, have uh, kind of settled after those plays have come through. The trade-off, absolutely worth it. It's still a scaling game for Ginger Turmeric. They still have the Senna. They still have the Victor. But again, getting through this mid-game, especially being down two dragons, is going to be a very tough prospect for this team. Victor did just pick up their first uh, item as well, so did complete the Leandres, has that ready to burn away some of the HP that no team will look to build, and Dragoon, ever so aggressive into existence here. This is why this is such a signature champion for them. You can see existence trying to duke it out with this set, but look at what Dragoon is doing to him! He is just smacking him up! Oh. Existence is down griffin secures the kill and now the chase down is here it is imminent the grain doing his job as a sponge absorbing as much damage as possible but this shotgun is tearing oh! through it beautiful onslaught of shadows comes in but the cavalry has arrived from no team they're looking to continue their aggression forward but lagrain is putting in so much work on this scion just socking away adam blaze looking for the re-engage but not able to find their mark on either end goodness gracious across the board no team i mean they, they start off with dragoon just in a fight everybody ends up collapsing around the area and right now it seems like you know ginger turmeric are trying to find some response because their front line is going down really quickly they've got damage in a couple of places you can see duo king can actually put in some work but unfortunately without ultimate from existence without being able to turn with a full team all together it's difficult to deal with what no team was bringing to that fight on the bottom side and it leads to so much because now all of a sudden bot side is pushed out mid side is going to get pushed as well as soon as Blaze shows up there after the bottom side fight, and that opens up for third dragon now, as it's Ginger Turmeric who are shifting in the top side Ooh. to look maybe to help cover for existence, taking the top tower. They might understand that they don't really want to fight around the next dragon, so they're just going to give it away, and instead set up for a lot of entrenching around the Baron buff to ensure that there's no possibility that no team can grab that one and accelerate this game any faster than they want it to. You can Very see curious thing. In the top lane. Dragoon knows that there were three members up here. He had the vision, so the rest of the team is going to call the bluff. They're jumping on the City Witty. Lots of damage being put onto him. And oh, taking him on the journey. City Witty runs a lot of damage on him. The Super Mega Death Rocket comes up big. They are firing away rockets. Look at Five Fire just tearing apart them. A triple kill on the blaze as well. It is an ace for no team. What a call from no team as well, because you could say, okay, if you take the save play, you go bottom lane, you take the dragon away, you give up top tower, and you probably push bottom lane, and maybe get the bottom inner, or you get a bunch of chip damage, you maybe push for mid inner, but they don't. They play for the fight on top side, because they know they're stronger, and they bogarted themselves to being stuck up here. Griffin and Dragoon get themselves very much on the front side, great flash ultimate, it's difficult to find these angles as the set, and Dragoon able to find it with Masterclass, and the AoE damage was enough to win this fight on its own, and like you said, Five Fire comes in for cleanup. You've got uh, on the backside as well, Blaze just doing a bunch of work between those two. After that amazing engagement, there's no way that the side of Signature Tumor are able to do anything. And that means Baron Buff on the table. Dragon isn't going to be on the table quite yet. At least they're up 10k, which is the huge thing that they want. They don't care if they give up a Dragon. Dragon would just be a cherry on top of everything else because it would mean they can also force to soul points in just a little bit of time, five minutes after whatever the Dragon is taken. I know Ginger Tumor are going to want to deny that. The redeploys are coming out really quickly. They actually might be playing for an attempted fight here. I don't think they win an attempted fight here. They're just pulling their own time away to potentially take the dragon. Yeah, they've waited too long. They should have collapsed on that dragon pretty much instantly to try to deny it. But now they might be bathing for a fight. That's the best thing I could think here. Oh, this is a very scary situation. Dragoon has the ability to take Lagrain and turn him into a very large hammer to beat Ginger Tamara with. They're looking for a play. Super Mega Death Rocket over to the side. Hecarim gets the dragon, but look at the price that must be paid. A triple kill. Tra Dragoon, four kills in quick sit session, and no team are expanding their lead every single time they fight.
And now they got 30 seconds of time to be able to work with with the Baron buff to shut down the base of the side of Ginger Turmeric. No team have everything. Again, the dragon doesn't matter to them in the oh slightest. And that's a huge play from Firefire. Flexing with the Jinx. Able to find a perfect angle for the Shock Blast. And that is enough to bring down mid inhibitor turret. There's no way it's held individually by Duo King. You got bottom side being pushed as well. Ginger Turmeric, they have got to fight tooth and nail to keep this game going. It doesn't seem like they have a way back into it, but they have to keep fighting because this is, again, they're proving Brown's lives on the board here. No team are just taking it to them again and again. What have you got in the tank, GTC? Because you are at the absolute end of your line. At the end of their line, indeed. This is a 13k gold lead that is in favor of no team. And look at this. Look at what Five Fire is doing to existence. Gwen, not immune from rockets, it turns out. <laughs> doing so much work on the champion. We got a TP coming in from the top side. That is going to be Blaze rejoining the rest of the team, guiding in these minions with the Baron buff. They're looking for the pit. They get the charm. Oh. They're going to be able to go dominating inside of it. Scion next Easy. to follow the Senna as well. Everybody's being wiped. This is game for no team. It's that easy to write things up. No team, they started off on such a good foot. They end up fighting very heavily against the side of Jinja Turmeric, who put up an amazing game number two. But going back to standard, going back to having faith in your mid laner in Blaze, and being able to go to something that Griffin can carry on, and that's all they need to do. They test Jinja Turmeric's resolve, and it breaks so easily. Ginger Turmeric fall out of the tournament. No team continue. They take on Maryville in the next round to go on to the finals. And what a performance to send us out in this quarterfinals with. I mean, you're, the quarterfinals have been nothing but insane here. Like, <laughs> we, oh, on the day, Rebel, I just want to bring this up. On the day, we've had four matches, right? Three of those four matches have gone into three full game series. <laughs> like, we have seen... These teams are fighting two Penel. These are the first and second seeds outside of groups that are really tangling with each other. We saw a much more one-sided affair in quarterfinals inside the first qualifier. This time around, these teams, the aggressiveness doesn't stop and no team, they're able to go further than what they were before and they are showing up, it seems. Listen, the, the fact that they have the tool of being able to take the Olaf Soraka is amazing. Uh, I like that they also make the adaption of saying we're not going to go back to it again and again. We're going to make it, we're going to go back to a standard game. We could take a standard game against Ginger Turmeric, and it worked out really heavily in their favor. They, they took a gamble on their players, and I think their players are players that are worth taking a gamble on. And I'm really appreciating uh, that this organization was able to actually put faith in them to be able to kind of clutch up when the time was necessary. Falling out of the tournament doesn't have ramifications for this team, right? Like they're still going to be top three. In out of proving grounds they're still going to have one of the highest scores they're, they're going to be fine they're never dropping out of the bottom six so they are guaranteed into proving grounds as well uh so the fact that they were able to light a fire on themselves in game number three against a team that had everything to lose and say we're putting our foot down we're playing standard we'll play your game and we're going to beat you at it and then going out and doing it is just such a phenomenal thing for them to be able to accomplish every single player on this team is incredible they were working with a substitute five fire had a great day today uh, that that zigs game was one of the most entertaining that an adc could have ever possibly <laughs> had to, to kind of kick him off uh and that final game was really good as well like the substitute i don't think they looked quite as good uh with five fire in an adc because obviously he's roll swap scoop is definitely the preferable one but they didn't lose much by having a substitute in which also speaks volumes to the system they're running to be able to kind of plug and play a player like that um even one as talented as five fire to basically no loss and hey look all the players got to show up every single one of them had their individual moments inside of this series but rebel that's it for us here on the caster desk we are going to go ahead and throw it over to a break and when we come back we're going to have some interviews ready and our desk is going to send us away for the night so make sure you do not touch that browser Hello everyone, welcome back to the stream. I am joined by the victorious marksman today <laughs> of No Team and Five Fire, Aiden. It's good to have you back on the stream, man. Uh, uh, great sitting down and talking with you. And just want to start, I mean, this was obviously something that was planned uh, for No Team and Scooped. I, how many days of practice did you have? Like, what's it been like playing marksman for the squad? Like, uh, it's, it's good to see you back. How's that been? No, yeah, I mean, we, we knew a little bit. Um... But, like, definitely we didn't have a ton of time, right? It was only, like, a week between the last match and today. And, you know, they didn't want to scrim with me too early, right? Stuff like this. But, um, so I think in total we got three, maybe, like, three and a half days of practice. 
um which is decent you know it allowed us to test some things out right like we obviously valued like the zigs very highly we knew we could play zigs into jinx um and then like we knew we could take the jinx back as well right and we we even had some stuff that we didn't get to show so like our practice was definitely still solid um but yeah i mean mostly shout out to the whole team for you know taking me in uh you know we figured out some good game plans some good styles in you know this short amount of time and i'm glad i was able to work out yeah now i i know that you know you have the history of being called the king of amateur no one's taken that crown yet what's it been like hopping into this squad and you know like what are some of the the takeaways that you had obviously being someone that's competed in a lot of teams beforehand with a lot of young players what are some of the things that stood out to you about playing with this team yeah, so I mean, this team, you know, it's so it's so cool just getting to because I, I also I've been kind of a spectator for this team over the past month or so. I've uh, been helping out Blaze and things like that. Um, but it's just super interesting to see like all the things that they're doing really well and like really solid. And, you know, all the individual players who, you know, maybe I didn't have as much like as high praise of before and just seeing like what they are all really good at. Um, like especially this past week, you know, my opinion of Flux has just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And grown as you know i've been playing with him in the bot lane right and he's basically been trying to teach me you know he would laugh at me <laughs> but he was like okay this game we're gonna try to cheat a recall and then after third <laughs> or fourth wave he'd be like okay this game i don't think we're cheater recalling you know like stuff like that um no but then also the other part that's really uh fun and interesting is getting to see all the little trip ups all the little mistakes all the little things that i know amateur teams do and that I've just seen time and time again, over and over and over, and sort of being able to help them work through that stuff, um, especially with Blaze, you know, trying to work through like, how do you become one of the better mid laners in amateur? You know, what do you need to do to position yourself to get to Academy? Although, I mean, what do I know about that? But um, yeah, I know it's been super fun, super interesting, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. I'm glad I got to play some games, you know, even if it was a mid lane. Yeah, and it was great to see you play again, Five Fire. And I know that part of joining this squad as a sub was also to get access for Champs Queue. So uh, what's that been like for you? I know that you've been playing mid, posting a highlight uh, here or two from there. What's that experience been like? You know, not only, you know, picking up the game and getting all those skills under your feet, as you know, you've been pretty vocal about saying, I'm still shaking some of the rust off, but also playing in that new environment that's been created this split and just being in Champs Queue and playing with all the pros. Yeah, no, I mean, if, I, if I'm going to be honest, it completely reinvigorated me. Like when Champs Q first got announced and I realized I couldn't be in right away, it actually, it crushed me quite a bit. Like I was barely playing any solo queue. I was just finding other games to play, like other things to do. I was watching, binging a ton of anime, whatever. Um, but then when, you know, no team were nice enough, you know, I'm good friends with a few of them. They were like, oh yeah, sure. You can have a sub spot so you can get to Champs Q. And I, I was like, okay, I'll also help here and there. They're like, oh, you don't need to, but I still try, you know, to give back a little bit. Um, and then, you know, when I got into Champs Queue, the first day, actually, I didn't play any games because I was busy. And I was like, ah, oh, shoot. But like that feeling of like, I want to play and I want to keep going and I want to get better, like felt so good. And then the next day I just went in, played a ton, played a ton, played a ton. I played a ton for like several days straight until these last few days where I had to take a break because I had other stuff to do. Um, but it was amazing. And I mean, I can only imagine because unfortunately right this split i joined really late so i couldn't really climb the ladder even if, even if i tried even if i had like a hundred percent win rate i wouldn't have hit rank one right right um, but now going into this next split which is going to start next week you know i have the full month to climb i have the full month to try hard and my win rate was pretty decent you know i was like hovering around 60 ish percent right and so i think i have a decent chance of you know getting into top five maybe even getting top three you know Lord knows maybe rank one and get all that cash, but uh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. it. It's completely reinvigorated me, makes me love the game again, enjoy it, even if I'm the one on high ping now, you know, I don't care. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just here. I'm happy to play. You know, I load up into the same game as Pride Stalker, Inspired, Core JJ, Hansama, you know, any of these guys and just instantly I want to try hard, right? And it feels so good. And yeah, I, I've been loving Champions Q and I'm looking forward to taking it really seriously this next month. No, I mean, that's awesome to hear. And I know that, you know, coming to this interview, you're like, yeah, I, uh, I want to talk about Champs Cube, right? <laughs> like, I knew you were really excited. To... You know, playing competitively as well, I, I got to ask, like, is, is this still something that you're really thinking of or keeping in the back of your mind moving forward and getting closer to summer? Yeah, so it's definitely, it's always there. The itch is always there when I watch people play, you know, when I, because I watch my friends, you know, all the time, you know, maybe I'm not completely in tune with Amateur Academy or whatever, but I still watch all my friends play and I see them. And, you know, I see everyone in Twitch chat and I see the tweets and I see the Reddit threads and all these things. And I'm like, oh, dang, I would love to play. 
Um, so definitely if a team, again, if a team provides me with any decent opportunity, you know, uh, I'm definitely still hungry to play. I definitely still think, you know, I, I have much more to prove. I have a lot more space to grow and improve and keep going. So yeah, I definitely really, 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 really want to play, but it does need to be the right situation because, you know, unfortunately I feel like I have been treading water for a while, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. but who knows, maybe it'll be an amateur team. Maybe I'll be playing on a collegiate team. Uh, maybe I move more into a coach capacity as I am kind of being positional coach for no team right now. We'll mm -hmm. see what happens, but I definitely, one thing I've, I've resolved is I want to stay in the space somehow. So whatever way that happens, I, I, I'm, I'll be here. Well, that, I, I, that makes me really happy to hear if I fire, uh, and Hey, uh, I'm wishing you the best of luck, man. I really impressed, you know, stepping into a new role with a couple days practice, <laughs> getting a win. Uh, congrats. I did a huge favor for no team, uh, part of that squad, and looking forward to seeing what you can do in Champs Q and what uh, the future holds for you as well. Uh, just want to give you the floor before we say goodbye. Any thank you, shout outs you'd like to give? Yeah, I mean, I guess I never really got to say a great thank you to everyone who supported me, you know, over the past couple of years, never really on broadcast, right? I kind of just made my tweet and then dipped out. But thanks to everyone who sent, who gave me support back in the day or when I was, you know, going through those tweets and things where I was like, I think I might be retiring, stuff like that. I hope you guys can all still cheer for me that I'm here. I hope you guys can all cheer for no team. Uh, you can also cheer for me at my stream, twitch.tv slash five fire, where I will be trying to stream champions queue uh, pretty much almost every day this coming next month. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for supporting amateur. All right. That's what I like to hear. Five fire. It's been so good talking to you again, man. Congrats on the win. Get the two one over ginger turmeric and getting no team into the semis. Nice talking with you, man. Thank you. All right, always good to talk with Aiden. I got to go back to the desk now and get our thoughts on the game three. Once again, going to be joined by Smax and Nova for one more time, a part of our long six-game day. Somehow we're still ahead of schedule, uh, but we did see a lot of action. Got a couple minutes, got to break down a little bit. The no team win. I want to start with the draft. Uh, we saw a lot of changes, and Smax, Ginger Tumeric, took some of your advice. They picked up the Gwen, but it felt like no team had better <laughs> answers, and the more controlled early game did them a lot of favors. Yeah, this, this really does feel like a draft that suits Ginger Tumeric very, very well. Uh, you have the Senna Scion, the same thing as the last game, the Gwen also. I just think that without the big explosion that they got from the early invade in game two, it became a lot more difficult for them to actually get off the ground and no team sort of kicked back and realized that they were in dire straits they didn't want to lose in this series and they they played it slow until they found that opportunity which uh can do a lot to shut down a draft that your your opponents feel more comfortable in for sure and i i feel like you know with all the spice that ginger to was throwing this time around no team had a much better answer to that scion senna and yeah. Nova, you know, as a coach, someone that is also an enjoyer of this lane, as I am myself, what, what are some of the difficulties of going up against the Scion Senna? And uh, how do you think, you know, uh, no team were able to play around that better this time around? Yeah, I mean, it just comes with the fact that generally a Scion Senna is pretty unkillable. And so, you know, you think about this huge, beefy Scion in front of you, and then at the same time, you just have Senna, who's able to provide so much damage, but at the same time, so much sustain through her Q, and then also her ultimate. It's like any opportunity you have to try and kill him generally is kind of faltered by by that combo right um but i think no team definitely played it a lot better this time they seem to i think both teams in the first two games they kind of were way more active in the early game i think that's just kind of sometimes what happens in a best of three and then we kind of saw in this game it was nothing like the first two games right both teams were taking their time uh they were letting their comps kind of do all the talking rather than like some early game ganks or some early game 2v2s um i think that's kind of where we saw things kind of start to take more of a turn is that no team was showing hey like when it comes to later parts in the game, it's exactly what we talked about. We are better when it comes to scaling. We like we will play team fights and dragons and all that kind of stuff better later, um, and that's exactly what we see happen. All right, we got to start diving into the replays, going over some of the footage. I, I know first off, uh, really just have to talk about what, what ended up happening. Uh, Smacks, walk us through this this first dragon fight from no team dropping the herald. Griffin got involved early, and th the angles they were able to find from boys were really good. Yeah, this was the very first big team Ooh. fight of the game as well. There weren't a lot of kills up until this point, but we're seeing immediately in this one the power of these resets on Ari and Blaze's comfortability on this champion as well as Five Fire. This reset style of the Ari and the Jinx can sometimes lead teams into some dangerous scenarios because they don't have enough burst to actually kill somebody, but 
when you have a champion like Graves who can just 100 to 0 somebody in that front line so well, it does wonders for your team. And then Blaze got really ahead. It became a lot easier for them from there. And that's where you get into situations where Five Fire and uh, Five Fire roll swapping to bottom lane on this Jinx gets to go for all these resets and get the most damage in that game, as we saw earlier. Yeah, but, you know, to, to Aiden's credit, might have looked a little bit more auto-filled in game two, but I, I think he really <laughs> picked it up in game three and brought it back when no team needed it most. Of course, Five Fire, someone that's always been clutch in these amateur tournaments, even in a different role. Uh, Nova, I know we got one other big replay here. want to set you up for. This was the top lane fight before Baron. And the way the Dragoon was just able to break this game open for no team, I mean, my goodness, this was a hell of a play coming out of him. One thing to really keep in mind is that this was all planned. Like, it was all on vision what GTC was trying to do in terms of making this top lane play happen. And Dragon was like, yeah, I'm going to go under turret. Like, if you try and make a fight happen with me, like, it's not going to matter. Like, we're just going to win this, right? And we saw exactly what happened. Dragon was confident in his own ability. He just ripped through the entire team with the set ultimate, right? And that's kind of what ends up happening when you're playing set into Scion is it's like, yeah, I'm really tanking on Scion, but like, that just kind of backfires sometimes when you're playing champions like set. So, really well played. I mean, it's kind of that execution thing that I was talking about. No team just know that when it comes to later parts in the game, they're going to play better. And that's exactly what ended up happening in that team fight. I think it is worth noting, uh, one of the traditional counters into Scion Top, as you just brought up, it, it is that set. I mean, it's something that I know, uh, specifically Tenacity as a player, always likes <laughs> playing uh, set into Scion. Always really good at it, too. Uh, even though it was that support, Dragoon using that to his uh, best of abilities so with that 5 pick, that set, flexing the Graves ended up being really nice. Uh, no team showing some more flexibility there. Uh, that, that is all we have for the replays. Just kind of want to ask you uh first smacks but then nova like any closing thoughts on the series before we wrap up today well the semifinals are going to be very fun that thing is for certain we already have the big titan of hundred thieves out of the mix thanks to maryville university so i mean at this point it's anybody's game and if if no team is any indicator right there i think uh i think this is going to shake up into something Really big and, and a huge upset as well. Already Maryville taking that one down. Um, the, the big thing to consider for the, the Proving Grounds qualifier points as well. Um, I believe there is one team that can uh, move up. Yep, okay, so there it is. Maryville has the chance to actually get into top six. And to do that, they need to beat no team. So... That's going to be the match to watch next week on Monday. Okay, so I, I will say this is fully updated except for Taco versus No Team. So put Winthrop at five, move Taco and No Team up to uh, three and four. Uh, so th oh. that was the result that we just had for our last uh, quarterfinal. And also, if Immortals AoE win the whole entire thing, they are the number one seed. So that is another That's really true. big thing to be looking out for uh, with the rest of these seedings. But for Proving Grounds fans, if we could throw that graphic up once again, we do have our 10 team set. That loss from Ginger to Merrick, it just, it, that would have been both wildcard teams being out of the tournament. Now they're both in the tournament. Uh, so wildcard, uh, that was really important for them as we have that duo now at 9 and 10 that is locked in. The Saints are going to be locked in in that 8 spot as well. Maryville and EGP, that's the only thing. That's a huge match for Maryville. If they win this best of five, they will, uh, or I should say best of three uh, yes, for yeah. semis. They will uh, be escaping that play-in, where it is the do-or-die best of three against the bottom four academy team. So that is a very big match for both No Team and Mary Maryville, posturing for those seedings. Uh, and that's something we're going to have to look out for next Monday. Oh, it's going to be so fun. I can't wait for that. Yeah, I, really I'm looking forward to that a lot. Uh, Nova, I know that you have been joining us for this last series. Special guest, once again, head coach of University of St. Thomas. Before we say goodbye, I just want to give you the floor. Any thank you, shout outs, anything else you'd like to say? No, I think the really important thing and takeaway from the Five Fire interview is definitely that there are more people working behind the scenes that we know, right? And so really make sure that we're giving credit. And obviously for you guys as viewers, like if you see a sub roster and just don't like count them out and just be like, oh, well, they're only here for Champions Q. Um, sometimes that is the case, but obviously in Five Fire's case, and I know even for Radiance, we had situations where people behind the scenes were definitely putting in a lot of effort. So definitely shout out to the people behind the scenes and just about every every aspect of this. Most definitely. Awesome. Well, I, I mean, great, great of you to lend some of those uh, words for your final thoughts, Nova, someone who is behind the scenes for, uh, you know, one of the average teams, one of the collegiate teams. Really appreciate you joining us on the desk for some insight today on helping us with those drafts and more of the game plans we saw, especially in the second series. Smacks, all day, man. Once again, uh, anything else you'd like to leave us with? 
Yeah, uh, 12 games in two days. That's a, that's a good way to start the week. Um, yeah, this, this is my last time on this broadcast. I'm going to be in the Twitch chat next week, so uh, be sure to tune in for that one. I'll be in the chat with all you gremlins there. Also, be sure to tune into Academy tomorrow and Thursday. Some really good games to uh, yes. get close to rounding out the the round robin right it is not just tomorrow and thursday it is also friday we have our second super week Ooh. that of course starts at 1 nice. p.m pacific uh tune in support the academy teams as well but uh until then thank you so much speaking of people behind the scenes we got a wonderful production staff it's been really helping out the tos everyone and also thank you to our sponsors could not do this without them uh atlantic skull has been seeing some of the gear they have as well uh, it's Paul D. And then Gangster, if you need to set, schedule some scrims. Uh, the sponsors have been really helpful get, helping us get the show off the ground. Helping us make sure we have enough people behind the scenes to support us. Observers, producers, TOs, everything that we need. Thank you so much to everyone who made that show, this show happen today. And a special thank you to the teams and players for bringing the entertainment, bringing all the action, and giving us some good games on Switch.tv slash Academy. So with all that said, thanks so much for tuning in. Catch Academy tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific. We'll see you then.